Welcome to the new folks. Is there anybody else that's this is their first time joining us? Yep. Hi, Diane. Um, and where are you based? I live in New Jersey. New Jersey. All right. Whereabouts? I was based in New Jersey for a number of years. Uh, I live in Englewood. Okay. I went to Drew University it's and uh, uh, Monmouth College. So both ends. And then I lived oh, in cool. Princeton for a while. I've been all over New Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> nice. I'm, I'm about a mile out of New York. So yep. right by the George Washington Bridge. Right. By that exciting set of interchanges. And they're closing <laughs> some of the um, rest areas in there right now for reconstruction. I'm here. And so, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. The mess here. Always. Nice to be here. So I got to say, I went through New York a month ago and man they're making good use of the of the federal funds for the bridges and things like that i don't know that in my entire life of living on the east coast i had such a smooth trip through through george washington bridge area and the the 95 up to connecticut so they're yeah. doing something right and, yeah and actually the uh, tappan zee bridge they redid that entire bridge so it's beautiful yeah, yeah. Um, although I love the old style tap and Z because that's where I grew up. So, yeah. Um, anybody else that's brand new? Uh, this is Joanne. Yes. Hey, I'm Joanne. New. I'm in Excellent. Asheville, North Carolina. Nice. Very nice. Oh, so you've got some good schools to go to near you. Oh, yes. Good. Yes. Yeah. We yeah. have Penland and Aramont. This is too loud. Yep. <laughs> All right. Anybody else new that wants to introduce themselves? I think I think I recognize the rest of the names. All right. Well, because we have a few new folks, I'm going to do a little bit of my usual rundown that I start with. Um, so I'm, I'll welcome you all and say drop in for as many or as few of these sessions as you have time for. It's not anything that you will miss the end of the world if uh, if you don't show up one after the other. Um, it's not really so much an instructional series as it is play along at home. You can bring projects to um, show and ask questions about from the group. Um, and always I'm gonna put them up within about a week to two weeks, depending on my schedule after the session is done. So you can always play catch up on video if there's something you you miss. Um, do remember that we're recording it for that purpose. So you're, you're giving permission by being here to be recorded and put up on YouTube. Um, and we are meeting the third Wednesday of every month. They'll all have to look at the holiday schedule. I don't know where those Wednesdays fall this year. Um, and I'll let you know via an email if there's going to be uh, an emergency, something that has me not be able to join that week. Um, but uh, usually, usually it's just a, hey, next session, I'm not going to be here because I'm out of town or something like that. So I'll give you 30 days notice of it kind of thing. Um, always be careful about the things you're doing at home. Be safe with your own practice. I hope you are careful about your own health and well-being. Um, and this is designed more for um, take from it what you want. I encourage all students to take as many classes as they can from as many different instructors as you possibly can, because we all have slightly different ways of doing things. And the more ways you learn for one specific technique, the more you're going to be able to pull out of it just what works for you. Um, you know, I, I give the example of when I learned box clasps, the first couple instructors I took them from, I could not do a box clasp for my life. Then Joy Raskin gave me this magical flip it over on its back and work on it upside down. Voila. It was exceptional. It was a, 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 the game changer that I needed. So you never know what's going to get you there. Um, I do encourage this to be more of a conversation. If you've followed the John Cogswell videos or have looked at them at all, um, that was a lot more of me doing each exercise in his book, pretty much. Um, this is more of a back and forth. You'll see um, we're going to talk a lot about each other's work. And you'll also get to give me insights and thoughts on the pieces that I'm evolving out of my box of unfinished things. Um, I encourage you to pick a project to tackle from your own pile, but you don't have to, um, always ask questions. Don't, don't hesitate. If you're, if I'm in the middle of something like at the torch, if you put it in chat, I'll catch up with it eventually. Um, or sometimes I can hear you enough to do it. It depends on what I'm working on. Um, let's see, always work at your own pace. You're going to see me work at times faster and at times slower than you might. Don't judge yourself by the way that others are working on their on their own efforts. 
Um, and then at the end of each session, I'll try to tell you where I think we're headed um, for the next session with the Cogswell project. It was super easy. I could say, hey, this is the next stone setting we're doing, but this one's a little more abstract. So we'll go from there. Um, I'm gonna paste a few things into chat. So if you want to see them, there's a bunch of links that are links to all of my things, including to my actual workshops that you can sign up for if you want. By attending, you can also um, use my Rio Pro code, even if you've used, um, or my Rio for schools code rather, even if you have used uh, another teachers, they ask that you put those up um, and that way they you don't get extra, extra bonus off by having two or more teachers there, but it helps them track how their um, codes are, are running, how their teachers are involved with things. Um, my workshop schedule is going to be the next thing I post, if I can find my mouse again. There we go. I promise that we get all the business out of the way up front, and then we get to the fun stuff. Right, and then... Um, the next thing is that I had some business from last time that you guys asked me to look into for you. So we had talked a little bit about one of the ways to get rid of your jewelry is to donate it to charity. Now, as a maker, the bummer is, at least in the United States, is that you only get the value of the materials donated. So if you are ever asked to give something to a charity auction or something like that, what I encourage is is Go with your heart about whether you want to or not, whether that's a good charity for you. But know that sometimes it's actually better for all involved if you can get somebody to buy it and donate it themselves because you get money for having made it. You can even give them half off or something like that, and they get the value of the donated piece on their tax return. So just know that when you're taking a, that when you literally hand off a piece of your art to somebody, it's materials value only in the U.S. tax situation, which is pretty lousy for us artists, you know. Um, but some of the ways that I have found to donate are these two, um, and so. Ridwell is, again, a United States-based company. They're in a few different parts of the country. I'm not sure how much they cover. Ridwell is one of those add-on recycling companies where they will take products that the regular recyclers don't. And in some parts of their organization, they gather donated jewelry, and then they work with something like Seattle Metals Guild, where they take them in, repair them, and pass them on to some of the agencies that get them out to people who are starting careers again after houselessness, that sort of thing. Um, and I personally donate uh, to my local Dress for Success, which is definitely a national organization. Um, you would want to call before you do that. What I do is I do give a pair, uh, buy a pair, give a pair. So for every pair of earrings that I sell, I also donate a pair, not a matching set because a lot of my earrings are a little out there for business wear, but I donate a pair of earrings um, for them to use and give to their customer base so that when they're getting the nice business suits that they're getting to put on, they get a little bit of bling. Um, it's something nice to add, or they can use it as if they're doing an auction, they can auction off my work too. Um, so those are a couple ways that we talked about the idea of donating to charity. Um, and then the other thing that people had asked me to look into for them is maker's marks and where you can get yours made. So here is a set of different Maker's Mark places. So I have dealt with MicroStamp myself. That's who I've used. Um, I know lots of people who say Henry Evers is a good one. Um, Indian Jewelry Supply, I didn't realize they were making stamps, but they're great as, an, as a company. Um, and then the other two I have not heard of, but several people that I respect said that they had used them, Infinity Stamp, Stamps and Buckeye. I didn't have a chance to find their site. Um, in the case of my experience with micro stamps, um, what you do is you send them uh, a scaled GIF or J JPEG, rather, of the image you want. And they, I think they're laser cutting them. I'm not sure. Uh, but they, you tell them what scale you want and, and so on and give them the graphic um, and they'll make your stamp for you. Um, so if you're looking to get a maker's mark, that was one of the questions from last time. I had one other note that I'm hoping people who were on last, last session can help me remember what, why I took this note. I had torch fixes down and I don't know whether I took that before I did the little speech on changing out the O-rings and things like that. And so I got through it in that session or was there something specific we were talking about with torches that I was going to get answers for you on? 
Anyone remember? I, I think it was um, maybe referring us to other ways to refresh the information you gave us and how it applies to maybe different types of torches. Oh, because I because I would give the experience of what happens with the acetylene Smith tips. Um, so the only thing I have personal experience with are Smith tips. I know I have used Hoke and Hoke, Hoke, I don't know how you pronounce it, and a few others. Yeah. Um, but I don't know their repair process as much. I know that Smith is so ubiquitous because they do plumbing supply torches um, that you can get a lot of stuff repaired from your air gas or whatever your local gas company is in your part of the world. Um, so you can get, you can often get your regulators repaired. Um, you can find the O-rings for the interiors of the, of the torch tips. Um, you can get hoses. Uh, the one thing that we were talking about a little bit was that the Smith little torch, um, replacing those hoses can be a royal pain in the butt. Um, there's a couple different models and any of the of the ripoff knockoff versions of Smith that I've seen have their hoses built in with no real way to replace them. So if you've got one of those, you may be out of luck and may have to buy the whole head unit and hose. Um, I don't I wouldn't drive you towards any kind of self repair on those personally. Um, there may be people out there who have videos on them. And I know that. Uh, Mark Nelson over at Rio has done some good care and feeding of your equipment videos. So it wouldn't surprise me if he has some advice on that front. So those are the, those are the tidbits left over from last time's questions. Any questions about my massive amount of information I just dumped on y'all in one fell swoop? No? Okay. So we usually start out with a little bit of reminder of the breakdown of what's in your box and how you can sort the kinds of projects you might have sitting on your I haven't gotten to it pile. Um, the areas that I've broken them up into are um, whether it is needing repairs. It's a good basic one. I didn't give, do my master list here anywhere, did I? Uh, so it could be repairs. It could be the design is blocked for some reason, like you started building it, you had this great idea in your head, and then you got stuck stuck somewhere because it wasn't coming out the way you expected. Um, could be materials blocked. I've had projects where I'm in the like final last hour of building it and I break the main stone. That goes right in my box of unfinished things <laughs> until I can find a stone that takes its place or decide what I'm going to do because usually it's a one-of-a-kind stone. Um, it could be that you realize, hey, I need more bling. I need some gold and I don't have any in stock or I need a specific color of gemstone that I don't have or something. It could be technique or skills blocked. You know what you want to do. You just know, don't know or haven't convinced yourself you're ready to do that technique. So in that case, that's one of the easiest to keep working towards. It doesn't mean you're going to solve it easily, but there are ways to get yourself psyched up to practice specific techniques to do smaller projects that use the scary technique um, and part of the reason that I do this is so you can see me showing some techniques of various sorts uh, I'm going to do that on one of the pieces today that'll be a useful skill um, and then sometimes it's because you just hate it you know it didn't go the way you wanted you don't like it sometimes it just needs to be taken apart and rethought and so you're going to see there, there's lots of other reasons you might have tossed something in the pile, uh, ran out of time, had a more important project for a client. Um, but it's a good idea to go through and sort those pieces into the uh, into the little buckets and then tackle them in bunches. You know, take apart all the things that you want materials from before you start working on the projects that you got stuck on design wise. And you might go, oh, hey, if only I put this stone I just recovered over with my half finished project voila, my design idea comes back to life, right? Um, so what we're working on right now is one that got stuck partially because of some technical challenges. How was I going to connect it? What was it going to look like when it was fitted? Um, and partially because uh, I, the stone felt like it deserved more and I didn't like the bezel that I had made for it. It was a little too wussy for the stone. 
Um, and so with the help of the group, if you watch the last session, we're evolving this piece rather more consequentially than I expected it to be in my original design. And I'm trying to let it sort of ebb and flow. I'm not doing a lot of pre-sketching on this one. Um, but all of those are things that if you start looking at your own pile, if you're somebody who really likes to just like get some stuff done, you can go through and do all of one sort of category and just work your way through them. Um, and you'll find that the pace picks up as you go because you start getting more confident about the steps you're taking. Um, in my case, my first step was take things apart for lots of parts. And we got a ton of scrap silver. We got some components back. We've got a number of stones, lost a couple of stones, which is to be expected as you're trying to take them out of things. Um, but it's got a couple pieces that I'm now refurbing in, in other ways. I've got some repairs or things that had a chipped stone that I've now found an alternative for. And I'm just sort of gradually working my way through those. Um, does anybody have anything in any of those categories or something else altogether that they're stuck on and they want to show right out of the gate? Anyone? Nobody volunteering today? Oh, Carmen. Yes. Unmute for me and I will spotlight you. Hello. It's been a crazy Adam. day. I'm sorry. I'm just That's okay. Myself. I can relate. <laughs> Um, I tried to follow the instructions from last last time we got together, and I worked on this piece. Nice for the riveting. Yeah. So, I mean, I like it, but it's not the three dimensional look that I was looking for. Yeah. So I think you may have missed a, an an idea in the in in between, which is that you put a piece of tubing that is uh, uh, bigger than the main rivet in between. So you put a little chunk of tubing that the main rivet runs through as a lift. Yeah, I did that here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like you'd done on the other ones, yeah. So you're just cleaning up your rivets on this new version. So what you practiced mostly was how to get more of the kind of rivet that you wanted, the look. Yeah. Cool. How'd you feel about the end result? This one's better yeah. than the other one. Um. But I, I still I still can't figure out the actual how to get the size right. So the you mean trying to get a more consistent roundness to your rivet top or the, the yeah. height of it? Are you the talking about height and the roundness? It was getting smashed. Yeah, so so it does look like you're going with taller than you need all the way around on all of those. Because the goal of a good rivet is that it is going to be hard to put through the hole that it's riveting down. Like it shouldn't slide around in there. That's step one. Get your hole and your drill bit, I mean, your your tube and your drill bit to be so snug that it is hard to push the tube through. Then you got to get almost to the surface. Like there's going to be the tiniest little bit showing above the surface of the tube. Mm-hmm. And you got way more than you need, I think, on any of those. Because as soon as you start to flare it, yep. it's going to cover. It's going to be wider because you've made that hole such a snug fit. Now, if you make your hole too wide and it's wobbling around, that's where you end up needing more topper. So try, uh, try an exercise for yourself on your next one where you are getting more and more close to the surface. Like not even we're not talking like a quarter of a millimeter, half a millimeter at most kind of thing on the part that you're going to be tapping down because you don't need a heck of a lot. As soon as it starts to flare, it's holding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, nothing says you can't do the larger if you want that look, but if you're looking for that like perfect, really just a circle coming out, that's what you're aiming for. Yeah, I'm not aiming for this. I, I want the space. But I was yeah, yeah. Curious. So that's that's a matter of what you're putting for lifts in between. But uh, but were you mostly were you were talking about that as a practice for getting tighter rivets? And those those rivets are looking nice and snug by comparison. I think you still can do with less material than you have up top on on yeah. either outside edge. Yeah. But that's a nice clean piece, and if you did it in mixed metals, it would have a cool sort of silhouette looking thing. It's a neat, straightforward design. I like it. Mm -hmm. Cool. So I tried. I'm I'm getting there. 
but yeah, practice. good practice. Yeah. And what tools did you end up using for your dapping on that? Um, I used a riveting hammer. I used a bunch of stuff. Okay. It was get, it was getting work hardened. With brass, and, it's going to go quick that way. Yeah. So I was just, I mean, I used a bunch of hammers. Can you see? So do me a favor and next time try using a, a dapping punch first. Um, and then put the put a smaller dap. Once you've got one side dapped, put a smaller dap in a vise and do the top dap from the other side. Let me draw that one because I'm not explaining things well today. Bear with me. You mean using a dapping ball? Yeah, using the ball of the dap. Okay. So what we're doing is here, I'm gonna spotlight me again so you guys can actually see me. And here we go. All right. So um, what I'm talking about is if we've got our vice jaws here, right, and we put a dapping tool here mm -hmm. and clamp it really tightly in the vice, and then our piece and our tubing is going to sit right there. So let's pretend we have a piece of tubing in between. And then our tubing sticks out a little bit, right? So by resting it against a dap and then put another dap as your device that you are hammering down, because it's round, see if I can get this camera aligned a little bit better so you guys can see. So because it's round, it's gonna flare out your tubing consistently all the way around, okay. right? Uh -huh. And I think you'll be happier, at, even if you then follow up with a hammer, if you want some texture on it or what have you, you'll be a lot happier with the overall shape of it. It should get more this than mm -hmm. this, right? Mm -hmm. When I'm doing, now, conversely, if I'm doing a bigger rivet, I don't want to do that, right? If I'm doing a wire rivet, then I'm hammering, Let's say that this is the top bead or, or top of the wire. So this is my wire here sticking out through my plate. I'm going to be hammering using this cross section mm -hmm. of a flat hammer. So my go-to for that is something like this, right? Yeah. And so I'm going to do this way and then I'm going to do this way until I start to get a fairly even splay. And then I can either work my way around, or then I can move um, to the peen end of a ball peen hammer where it's got just a little bit, uh, or a riveting hammer where it's got just a little bit of a curve and that will soften all of the marks that I've made. But my start is really gonna wanna be that cross section because it's, think about it, it's pushing the metal outward when you do that. So this is pushing the metal this way, this is pushing it this way. So it's all flaying, splaying out across the top. But yeah, when I do tubes, I prefer on a dap. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any questions or other ideas from folks on that one? Okay. Who else has something they would like to get some insights on? Oh, uh, Gwen Youngblood has a plate system? Tell us more, Wendy. Gwen makes amazing tools. Oops, you're on mute though. Okay. She has um, 14 gauge, 16 gauge, 18 gauge in their little plates that you put on top of either a tube or a wire. And that's where you snip it off. So oh. it leaves you just the right amount that when you remove that plate and start tapping, you don't get that, you get a more even rivet. So basically she's made steel plates that are the thickness she recommends for what hangs out above the metal. Right, right. Oh, that's super cool. Yeah, and you can do it on your own by just using sheet, but I mean, it yep. just, it's so compact with her, her system. Nice, okay. Well, there you go, gang. Um, <laughs> Gwen, is, 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 it, is she still doing it, all of the uh, rolling rolling mill plates? 
Is Gwen, is Gwen still making rolling mill plates? They, what she? Yes. Yes. Yeah, she is. Okay. Good. Not plates. Oh, the the, pla the cutout sheets, right? She does the yes. paper. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, some neat patterns. Anybody else have riveting tips and tricks? But Wendy, um, is that just with the wire, but is it also with tubing? Similar principles with the tubing to the wire in terms of height, because you're yeah. still you're still just trying to push the metal out. It's just that there, there's nothing in the center to help with the push out there. And the holes are big enough in the plates to slip over a tube. Nice. Okay. Okay. I'll have to look into that. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else have something they want to show or ask for ideas on? Okay. If you change your mind, we got time. I guess it's back to my chaos then. Oops, you got something, Deanna? Got to unmute yourself. Um, I made this years ago and I made a chain for it that was out of uh, little pieces of square wire that are looped together. Nice. And no one cared about it. No one was interested at all. And so I still like it. Yeah. I still want to do something with it. Now, this is a piece of silver. And then it's just aluminum can behind the piercing. Cool. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, this is actually a vinyl floor tile. Oh, that's awesome. Um, I just really love the color. And I thought, you know, yeah. that'd be a fun background. So inside this piece of silver is just this vinyl uh floor tile that's about that thick and then you've got your piece of aluminum very cool so i took it apart yeah I took all the other little pieces of wire like this i thought maybe those were awkward i don't know what to do i can't solder it because of the tile in there yeah the stuff inside would not handle heat well right at all. um the only thing i could think of was to just cut these little pieces closer and make a, a loop but there's got to be something cooler I can do with that so glue is not your enemy first of all I know we're all taught from the early days that we shouldn't use it in stone setting but there's a lot of mixed materials these days that it you need it right so I wouldn't say no to glue I would not generally want to glue metal to metal um but what you're what you've done there is made a centerpiece of some really interesting materials. So maybe you need to think about other materials than metal for what you hang it on, right? And are is that is that wire running through a hole so it can have movement? Could you run something else through it? No, I just soldered these wires directly onto that bezel. Do you think you could drill holes across it so that you would have the ability to run something? That's possible. Um, I'd have to be really careful. It's there's not a lot of play there. It's not right. very thick. Um, but if I could keep it straight, maybe so. So that's a possibility. Um, but you're, you're, I like your idea of maybe hanging on to enough of the material to make some kind of connector out of it. What about beads? What about gemstone beads or glass beads or something even more funky? made out of more of the aluminum, you know, rolled beads, the way that, that people do paper rolling. You can do that with aluminum too. Something that makes you a really distinctive and colorful chain that pops with both colors. Yeah. And then you're threading it, you know, you're, you're using it as if it were pearls and you would be using cord and silk cord knotting between the beads if need be. Yeah. Sometimes our brains get us caught into a single view because we've seen it in metal and we work in metal so that's what we're doing i have so many strands of beads that i'm like oh those are gorgeous i should use those someday do i use them no no they sit in box and i pull them out and i go wow those are really pretty i should use them someday every year for the last like seven years so that's one option anybody else have other ideas for her all right yeah 
Um, how about a uh, chain connecting to those two um, pieces of metal? Just straight up solid chain. What kind of chain would you get, would you recommend with that look? Mm, I don't know yet. Because <laughs> you said you what you were was it just a paper clip style chain, Deanna, that you had on there before? Square wire paper clip. Yeah. So what what visually did it do for the piece or not do for the piece in your opinion? Obviously, you liked it. You built it that way the first time. Yeah, I mean. I the reason I did this to start with was because I didn't want just a chain that comes down in a harsh V. I yep. just I wanted this line. Okay. Somehow. Um and if if it was a normal chain and it just hung on to these little pieces of wire, that might be that might be just fine. That might get the look I wanted and also be more interesting to people. I don't know. So um, you could absolutely, like a, a, the, the, the wires that you've got coming out of it right now give me the impression of like when a snake chain goes through something, it keeps yeah. some of its curvature. So I could right. see you continuing it with something that does that line. I think your instinct would be to keep it fairly clean and simple, mm -hmm. it sounds like because you have this great centerpiece. Um, and so maybe that was what was fighting you was that you had made that really delicate custom square wire chain, which has a lot of its own architecture to it when you have these beautiful soft rounded lines in the piece itself without having seen your chain. I can't, I can't say. Yeah. Um, um, I've got that. Stephanie, did you, right oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> this was the class. Um, oh, cool. Okay. Oh, so you were talking really big pieces of the square yeah. wire between segments. Long pieces that Which, just, and I thought maybe that looked uncomfortable. You know, I have had pieces that I've made where people are gaga over them. And I'm like, why do you like this one? And others where I've loved it and it takes seven years to sell. So it may just be that it didn't come in front of your right customer at the time but something is telling you you want to retry it and kick it off with a different look so i could absolutely see that on a set of cream pearls because you've got such a strong oh. pop of color uh-huh right i could i could see it on pearls i could see it on aluminum beads i could see it on a lot of other things either countering the countering the bright with something fairly neutral mm -hmm. or and it could even be a, a simpler chain that does the trick or multiple chains so that it's a strand, a, a twist of several chains. And it's all what you want is that. And what your gut is still telling you with keeping that wire is that it's still I'm waving my hands at you and I'm not spotlighting myself. So hang on a sec. Um, here am I <laughs> can't find myself now. Uh, where is my screen? So, oops, that's why, because I'm waving my hands with not the right camera on. So you something in your gut has kept you keeping that curve until you make some decisions about it, mm -hmm. which says to me that you want to still have that elegant flow up there. So maybe go and pull like ribbons. And if you have bead strands, bead strands. And if you have a simpler chain, or even if it's a chain on something that's not yours, you know, that you didn't make, um, pull them in and just sort of hook them onto what you've got, even if you need to use tape to do it, and see what it's going to do. But there's something that's telling you, make me the centerpiece, because you've kept those, that curvature. Mm -hmm. If you were to, go ahead. I, how do you stop that? chain coming out and adding something new what do you clip that and roll it how do you attach it like pearls you were saying pearls yeah how would anything you attach that, that anything that's threaded she could cut back the the end wires and make those closing loops on because they're soldered on she's got the wires soldered on okay so, so make, make loops make loop yep um okay. and you know if it's a little heavy for doing an actual twisted loop like that that looked like it was probably what 16 gauge wire or something give or take close maybe 18 
18. Yeah. So it'd be a little awkward. It's like one of the things you'll do often when you're doing pearls next to something and you can't do soldering is you do a little wrap um, just so that the wire is just closed on the loop. And you could do that up to the main pendant and give it that theme running through. Um, but yeah, basically you just need a loop. The other thing is you could submerge the piece in water and get a little bit of soldering done on the ends of those wires. Mm -hmm. It'd be a little tricky, um, a little risky. Um, and you could snip them off somewhere and then solder on jump rings, closed jump rings at the ends, whether it's at the end of the length you've got now or at a shorter length, you decide that based on what you're hooking it to. Stephanie, did you have any ideas on what kind of chain you could visualize it with? Not a paper chain, but it's just a chain that, you know, you could create your own little designs. Like, it doesn't have to be circles. It could be, like, I was thinking where you just said that uh, the jump rings, you could do triangles at the, at both ends of those, um, of the wire, and then start another, you know, design after the diamond, I mean, after the triangle shape, sorry. Yeah, I think I think what I'm getting from you, Deanna, is that your your lengths on the chain that you had originally may have made it less graceful. Fault like the front curve you're showing us, it may have gotten clunky as soon as you hit above that point. Yeah, and so Stephanie's idea of a simpler chain yeah. or any of the other things we've talked about might give that that graceful flow. Well, you guys are giving me ideas. I, I may do some kind of combination where I string some bead-like objects on here and yep. then this next to a normal chain of graceful, flowy chain. So then I've got a little more happening right here, but then this up in here is still graceful and comfortable. Yeah. I'd also, so that, that piece, that centerpiece is gorgeous. And I could see you doing a series where you are making those objects and using them as beads interspersed in chains or connectors. They'd make great earrings in smaller scale because that pop and that able to do reversible. Yeah. Reversible earrings, man, you do not, that those will fly off the shelves. Um, okay. And there's a bunch of different ways to make them reversible including there's entire companies that make their their careers out of paying getting people to buy different things that they can swap in and out of their main post you know pop-ons or flip-ons or hook-ons all kinds of variations on the theme so anybody else have ideas on this one yeah i i just say quickly I would consider the possibility if you forge the end of those wires, you could drill a hole instead of having to come in and solder something. Mm -hmm. It's also a way you could, on the longer length of wire, you could put a couple of beads, do a little forged area, then a couple more beads to create some space there. And also, I don't know if you ever make bead chains that's basically just wire wrap loops. That's another possibility of something that you could do for the um, chain piece. Cool. Yeah, the paddle, the paddle for forging would give you the opportunity. You could put a bunch of holes in that wire and hang drops. Not They wouldn't have to necessarily be strung on, and that would go with that flow that you're talking about. That's a great call. Yeah, I always forget to go back and look at wire as something I can reforge after it's not quite doing what I want. Uh, Carmen, did you have something else? Yeah. Yeah. Well, kind of similar to what Nancy said. Um, you can take maybe the wire. I was thinking yeah. you can easily add um, different sizes of maybe tube, but then like the paddle, like she said, make it movable. Yeah. So tube you know, you're connecting, maybe add the color of the within the pendant to a color tube of some kind, or maybe introduce more metal or something not this size, but 
the transition. I think the transition, the, it's it's a beautiful, simple pendant, but I was just wondering what the transition, if you want it to be movable or if you just want to add more texture to it. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Can I just suggest something? Yeah. Um, I really love the pendant and I was thinking of, the, you know, the two wires that she has coming out on the two sides, they kind of remind you either of tendrils or of um, horns or, or the antenna of an insect and how you could make work on that to make it a little quirky rather than something which is elegant. You can actually have a little bit of fun with it. Um, you could, I mean, on the wires, if there is scope to um, uh, solder some very tight jump rings and then string in a couple of interesting colored stones, uh, beads, or, you know, like the material that you love to use, plastic, uh, you can make beads out of that and string that in, or you could hang ribbons from it like people do in many religious cultures. They hang ribbons and around trees and it makes it very interesting and colorful. So that I, and you could, um, of course, make it into a necklace or a pendant, but you could also just, like you said, glue is not your enemy. You could just stick a brooch pin at the back and make it a brooch. And I think it'll, with those ribbons flying everywhere or the beads that keep moving, um, I think it'll make an interesting piece. Yeah. Cool. Lots of, I, I'm visualizing lots of textures and I can't wait to see some of your work, Pallavi, if that's the way you're describing the engagement on it. It's making me remember, there's a there's a gal who got pretty famous, I can't remember her name, from taking um, the colorful uh, coffee pods, those aluminum coffee pods, and crushing them and making amazing architectural jewelry pieces. And that's sort of what I'm envisioning when you talk about adding all kinds of layers and colors into it. Is some of those I, I it doesn't look like it's coffee pods is all I can it's gorgeous stuff I'll try to dig up her name okay anybody else have a project they want some idea generation from or that they're stuck on technically okay you come to this with what you come to it with you decide if you want to see anything um all right so I'm going to do a little bit of talking about what I have been thinking about since I last was with you guys, um, because you put a whole bunch of swirl in my brain when you were telling me ideas. Uh, let me see if I can get, this might be better on black paper or something. So let me see. I have a piece of that. So when last we met, we were talking about what I'm doing with the... Um, opposite side it was pretty clear that if I just kept with the stone that it was going to become a little too weighted towards the stone and I wanted something that counterbalanced it and we got to the point where we were talking about putting uh, connectors between them because I did I was originally thinking this that was too heavy so we're going to do a little bit of divide and I can't find my little scraps of square wire, but I think that we determined that I liked the square wire and probably three little cross pieces of some kind between it. So connecting them in some way and that lightens it up just by taking it apart. We talked about that this really needs to have a little bit of lift to it, although this is more lift than I want. Um, I think I want to make it a little bit lower than the bezel of the stone. Um, and then that was making me decide whether I want to go with square wire and redo all of these connectors or not. Let's scooch this a little further down. Um, and also talked about the fact that it needed some kind of splash of color. So you don't know how many different types of stones I have tried with this um, in the last couple of days because I was busy with other things and then realized I had not given it enough thought. But one of the other things that came out of it was that um, it, it was became much more interesting when instead of trying to do the matchy-matchy, where my large pieces go into smaller pieces, go into smaller pieces, and it comes up the like a traditional graduation, gradu graduated necklace, with the weight of this piece, it was more interesting to start with heavy on one side and light on the other in some kind of connector way. So this is sort of where we had gotten to is that it's going to get 
graduated small on the side. I'm going to pull out a little bit further just so you guys can see the whole picture there. Rachel, didn't last time you turned that light down a little bit so there was more contrast? That better? I oh, think I there was the, the other one um, on your left side. On my left side. Oh, did I add an extra light? I may have. Added, yeah, that's what I did. I added an extra light. Bear with me. I got to go grab it from my photography area. Is that a little better? Any better? Let's see if I take mm. this. There. That's okay? Yeah. So unlit to me. <laughs> okay, so, so we talked about the idea of taking these. I'm going to have to switch back and forth when I'm working at the bench because that's not enough light for me to work by. Yeah. Um, uh, but broadly, it was taking it to large down to small on the other side, something along those lines, um, and that it would be slightly rotated. So this is coming up the larger side, and this still becomes sort of the center drop point of the piece. Um, so that's where we had gotten to, except for determining that we didn't particularly like the way that gold added to this, because um, I was talking about for a while about doing kombu, Gold added this sort of yellowed out this main stone. And so I didn't care for that. Um, and uh, we tried a color, couple of colorful stones. And that had me digging for what turns out to be the exact perfect shape of stone. Could I have asked for anything more perfectly matched? Oops, that's really not going to show for you guys. Hang on a sec. I got to see if any of this light is going to help. And... Too washed out. It's up more. Is that better or worse? It's kind of grainy. Yeah, it is kind of grainy. Let me see if I can do anything with my zooming it in, moving the camera positions. Is that better? Yes. Okay. okay. Yes, no? I think so. It's better. Yeah, better. Yeah, better. So I have this unusual cut citrine that is literally the exact shape of the rest of the design. So that's one of my candidates. And if I were to do it, what I would probably do is not set it raised up, but because this is going to be a hollow form, I would probably nest it sort of buried into the hollow form at sort of just a tiny bit lifted up. So I'd make a little box area that it would sit within. And that would be one of my options, okay? Do you mean you'd set it from the back? Uh, let me draw, no, I wouldn't set it from the back. I would set it down into the hollow form. So let me draw this one the way that I was envisioning it. Okay, thank you. I think that would be beautiful. So we got choices, and this was my first choice, and then I tried some other things because I had other choices. So what I'm envisioning doing if I do this stone is if I'm constructing this hollow form shape that's going to have reticulation at the top, right, um, is that I will create the mirroring shape cut out only of that much and have the faceted stone set inside, probably bezel set, so that, and maybe maybe I would cut this, maybe I wouldn't, I'm not sure yet. Um, and so that, so this could be all blackened in here. And I'm gonna do this in two colors so you can actually see the stone set separately inside the blackness. Black, uh, dry erase markers are really not conducive to very pretty design. But what we would see from the side view is that we would just see the top of the stone with its facet sticking out. Okay, so there. So I'm not talking about putting it up here 
in a bezel. I want it nested in. So it's like there's a under the iceberg layer of where the, the stone sits down. Um, what that does is, so what I found was looking at it both on top and then envisioning it further down. Actually, oh, that's how I that's how I figured out that I wanted it set in. So until and I decide that I'm going to cut this away, I didn't want to cut it away. But just looking at it set up top next to the stone or near the stone, it drew away from the beauty of the sparkle of this stone. So then I said, well, what happens if I hide it a little bit? I can't hold this in a way that's going to be useful to you guys. What happens if I hide it a little bit inside of the hollow form? And then it tones it down a little bit because it's going to be a darker range of color. It's not going to be lifted and therefore prevalent to the eye, right? So it gives me a little more interest. And it also recreates this sort of cave-like space of the cutaway of the or the, of the druze of the of the stone so i didn't want to pop this all the way up so if i use this stone it'll be set deep inside the hollow form in some way so that's is, one option is that what you would call a shadow box yeah shadow box style that's a great great way to look at it it's not technically because i'm not yet sure whether i didn't completely encompass it or not but yeah conceptually a shadow box is what i was aiming towards so uh -huh. option Sorry, go ahead. Oh, the question I was asking is, so um, you're committed to the reticulated metal that you've got there on the left? I am. Texture for me okay. is what I am. It's thematic for me. Okay. Um, how much of that I will keep, right? It my may be the... Go ahead. Yeah, my thought is kind of a departure, but kind of in your wheelhouse. I looked at your bracelet and I know it's a weave and it wouldn't even have to be that same kind of weave, but I keep thinking it would be subtle to have like a weave framed inside that same bezel and then put your stone in the center. Hang on a sec, I'll grab Is some. Is too of my busy? You grab that, we can take a look at what that would look like. I just happen to have some weave here. I so thought you would. <laughs> something like that with the stone set in there. Yep. So to, to my mind, so while I am looking to do more integrated weave with some hollow forms, to my mind, it would not be opposite this stone. Right. This yeah, that would be the center then. Okay. Yeah. I, I could maybe do a finer weave, but the more you do delicate weave work on this, the more it draws the eye to the weave. Right. Uh, as people go, oh, is that really woven? Or did you rolling mill it? Or what did you do to get that? Um, and this stone is still, to me, the center point of it. And right. this is an accent if I use it. Right. Whereas this doesn't steal the show. It says, hey, I'm emulating the texture. So if you were designing this absolute, like any, but any of you may come up with your own version of a, of a piece like this um, and happily go ahead and do that kind of styling. My take is this one fits more in the vibe of subtler paralleling of the textures. I'm not, so in other words, I'm not judging your idea. I am. Oh, no, I would. It was just a, a thought. Um, yeah. I love the, the rest of the piece. Yep. You know, the necklace part of it. I love it. And I'm, it does. And I didn't. And I. the only reason why I thought of a weave is because that's bright. You know, the metal seems bright. Yep. And a weave does reflect more light. So this I'm definitely not going to leave in, in quite this darkened state. This was from us showing how it could be darkened. And I would polish parts of it up for sure. Except that I've been looking at some other things. So the next thing that I went to... The next thing that I went to is pearls. Because there is something sort of like the inside of a, a nautilus shell implied in these shapes to me, especially now that we're doing this, this gradually smaller cycle. But I don't particularly like the pearls there. What I, what I really am excited about is possibly putting 
curls at each of the corner points where they meet so that there's a little bit of dangle. And I do have different size pearls, but I'm not sure if that's gonna be too much. I certainly don't want the simple round pearls. They're not, they're a little too clean for this design. And so then I went back to the idea of faceted stones and the sapphires that we were talking about. What is, is um, if you concaved the piece that's on top? The reticulation? Yeah. And then added the pearl. If you concaved so, it, so it's kind of like hugging it. Yeah, reticulation is really, really hard to get a good concave on because it's got so many different um, uh, metal hardnesses in it by the time you've made it. Okay. I may try a design. Now that you've said that, I may have to try concaving something. Um, I'm worried about concaving it with a hydraulic press because that might push some of the texture out. Mm -hmm. But maybe not. Maybe with a good squishy durometer of press. Um, again, I think probably not for this design, but I'm going to make a note to myself because now you've got me thinking about hollow forms with concave uh, reticulation. Um, and I'm going to have to think how I would get that the way that I want it. Can so I this, just, uh, go sorry. ahead. No, go ahead. Um, what if you took your reticulated sheet, uh, a slightly maybe bigger one, and you soldered it uh, not at the bottom of your uh, uh, hollow form, but somewhere in the middle. And uh, you take a baroque pearl and you uh, slightly fold your reticulated sheet onto it so that it feels like it's kind of contained by it. Um, and then work with that. So something like this. I got examples for everything today. I can't see so, it. Set down no. in. Yeah, lower. Oh, lower, oh, deeper into the concavity? Yeah, yeah. And then you use a slightly bigger reticulated uh, sheet to uh, fold the Baroque pearl. So you're talking about making it do a, like a divide the way that sort of a bend in where this does? Yeah. That parallels it? Interesting. I like that and idea. That, and that will also, uh, like you said, you didn't want to use very round pearls. A baroque pearl will be uh, more organic. And it will if, if you can get the reticulated shield, I, uh, the sheet either through uh, with claw solder uh, on prongs soldered onto it in, where it's not very visible, in some way, it'll also kind of give it a very oyster feel to it. I'm not sure I followed that last bit. Um, you know how um, when you open an oyster shell, yeah. um, the pearl actually is not just sitting on top. It has to kind of be, it has to be pried out of the oyster, right? So you're picturing this folded this way, right? Yeah. So if you can fold it in a little way, that kind of gives a feel of an oyster shell rather than just have the Baroque pearl sitting or any pearl or any stone sitting just uh, flatly on top of it. A peekaboo. There's something uh, that is shaped a little bit like that with the pearl nested inside of it. Yeah. Either that or you could do a bit of a fold. You can do like... You know, um, I like a wave fold, not a um, um, so putting a little bit more fold than that in because I'm not going to go further than that without. No, you, you have a V shape. I'm talking about like a wave, a wave. You know, like uh, holding it like this. So, so the metal is coming like that, and this is where this, your pearl is. This piece is coming over? I can't see it. So the, you're talking about curving the back corner over? Uh, what is the back corner? So... You know, I think your uh, image has frozen. Oh, is it? 
Are you guys seeing me close up now? Yeah, yes. now, that, now I can see it. Yes. Okay, so are you talking about this coming up and over? This being, they're going to be like this. Yeah. No, I'm saying that if this is your reticulated sheet, this is yep. your curl, yep. and you have the reticulated sheet coming like this. So it zips in and out? Yeah, so you need a bigger reticulated sheet. So something more like this that I can wave in. Yeah. So I think we may be adding too many features texturally and dimensionally to it. And so yeah. I'm gonna I'm going to talk about uh I'll, I'll talk about this in the context of what causes me to go to oops, I've got to screen out for you a little bit. Um, what causes me to want to add something visually and what causes me to want to take things away. Um, it, those of you that watch uh, Project Runway, you'll always hear them saying edit, edit, edit. And I have to hold myself back on that one because this is this we're starting to get into the edit, edit, edit phase, I think. They're all great ideas and they're all great ideas for a series of pieces that could be related. Um, so as you can see, with this kind of a design, we can choose to go a lot of different ways. If I had five of these stones, I might be able to make five variations on the theme, one with this idea of the pearl opposite, one with my yellow stone that's the perfect shape, et cetera. Um, but we have to make some choices that go with the uh, flow of this particular necklace right now. And I'm going to use the phrase, shit or get off the pot. I have to make some choices and I have to progress forward. <laughs> <laughs> um, with this design. And I think that for me, because this is right now, it's being sort of a collaborative, you guys give me ideas and I decide which ones I want to take. For me, I've gone beyond the idea of, I now know that I want a hollow form. Um, I've got the reticulation definitely in there. Um, I'm, I really like that idea of a wave form, like all of the, I, I usually use my, um, reticulation silver as pretty much flat sheet because it has so much texture on its own. But you guys are definitely sparking some ideas that I want to play with around. Like, I would like to see, Pallavi, if you have some uh, some reticulation material of your own, I want to see that wave pearl combo because it feels like it, what you're describing feels like it could be a masterful, masterful pendant by itself. It doesn't need all the rest of this. Like, that's a that's a, you get a really good quality pearl, you put it right smack dab in the middle of that waveform, and that is a statement pendant by itself, right? So when I'm thinking yeah. about the ideas you guys are throwing out, some of it is yes, and it needs to be its own thing, as opposed to what's going to fit with this particular design as we work on it. So again, I'm not making judgment on anything anybody's tossing. It's more about how do we weave in the things that work for my for my particular uh, aesthetic in this case? Um, and then we play with the other things down the road. Um, Deborah, you're asking, consider weave with the stone. And so, oh, you already said that one out loud, so I didn't miss anything. Um, so let me talk about the last set that I came to that I think may be my first choice right now, um, which is these subtle champagne color range sapphires i have these facing upright that helps what um, is the color of your main stone the of the of these the main stone the big stone so that i don't know if i'm going to use that it's either this or these no 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 the main stone oh got it sorry this this stone is it's so that's part of the challenge on this one it is a translucent white with slightly right. hints and so part of what I'm deciding is, am I going to back it with black? Am I gonna, we determined that backing it with gold makes it go really ugly yellow, but backing it with gray or black kind of pops a little bit, especially yeah. if you cut away. Mm -hmm. But it's about how does it look in relation to everything else? So I suspect I'm going to do something like this cutaway on the back of my bezel once we get it backed. And then it's about what do I do with these stones? And I don't know that I'm going to be able to get close enough to give you guys a really good color play. Oh, maybe we can. So I don't know if you're able to see those colors, but there's like an orangey champagne, a more green champagne, and a more golden champagne amongst these sapphires. 
and that the subtlety of those modern uh, cut stones opposite the nature stone, the, the, the druze that's been popped out of this beautifully cut piece, appeals to me. It's got a little bit of color. It has hints of champagne diamonds without the cost of champagne diamonds. And it has sort of a, a draw of like a landscape. This makes it look even more lunar, like something has landed on the texture of the material. What are uh, the, those sapphires, Rachel? They're sapphires, yeah. yeah what size? What, what, what? What Millimeter. size are the sapphires? What size? Um, it looks like they're probably four or five millimeter. Hang on, I can measure one. Um, I have some smaller and larger ones, so I could scatter them. Actually, that's probably easier for you guys to see the color array that I've got. So these are just a few. Where's my spot? There's my spot. So Would I can you solder the tube on top or yeah, would you reason. yep i would put it on top of the regulation because they're low um i have sizes on these i do not see what my calipers tell me um i also have some much smaller ones uh i could ostensibly do some flush set mixed in because um this is fairly thick material Come on out. I think you would lose the sapphires with a flush set. Uh, not if I'm blackening around it and then leaving the flush set uh, bright, the setting itself. Because uh -huh. um, sometimes I'm looking for just a subtle spark. So these look like they're about four millimeter, a little bit bigger maybe. They're not calibrated stones by any stretch. Um, so the only problem I have right now for my decision, uh, well, there's two decisions I need to make still. One is which of the main, the, of the accent stones do I go with? And the other, which I can decide at a slightly later time in the process is, do I like the pearls? Um, and so my reaction is I don't particularly like the white pearls. If I'm doing these, the white pearls, maybe with the yellow. Zoom out a little bit, Rachel. Oh, thank you. Hang on a sec. Keep forgetting that I've come in close. So let me lay this out again the way that I'm envisioning it actually being hung. And um let's take a peek at this is going to be representative of probably three wires running between them. I when I see the pearls the way you have them, yep. I mean I can see you mixing the stones and adding a pearl. I think I think it has to do with what are you going to do with the top of that piece? And then are you going to rep replicate it somewhere else? Because, you know, it all ends up like, is it cohesive or not, right? Uh, so the top being at behind the neck, you mean? No, just in general, just how you have the pearls to the right right now. Yes, I was envisioning, so this feels very Art Deco in its lines, which mm -hmm. often have that kind of bonus dangle piece. So I was envisioning each point all the way around would meet at a pearl. Progress ideally progressively smaller pearls, um, you know, big to small, or it would go the opposite and it would go big to small. I'm not sure. Um, and I have some cream colored pearls that probably are even better than the white ones if I go with the sapphires. Roll around on me. Would you but put I your sapphires on top of your main stone? Say again? Would you put your sapphires on top of your main stone? Here? No, no. This stone is okay. going to stand by itself. Um, okay. I could maybe see doing something like that, but I don't think... I don't think I need, I want this stone, this this piece originated because I picked this stone for this right. particular thing. Sure. And so I think I would probably stick with yeah. just counterbalancing <laughs> on the other side. I think because you uh, put in those smaller sized pearls, then the focus came back on your stones in, in the main part. I think the heavier and the larger the pearls kind of fought against yeah, the I small pearls work better. So, 
keeping just a little tiny hint of pearl at the end of each. Can you go back and put the yellow stone on there with the pearls yep. laid out instead of the sapphires? Come on. How does this fit? There we go. I'm going to get some wax to put that down because otherwise it's going to go flip flopping all over. Hang on a sec. See, I so, still like that simplicity than adding three personally. I, I really like from what I see. So if I, I were to see this, the pearls definitely don't go color wise. They just don't sync up but, with that. But what if instead of the pearls, you would do the actual tube uh, instead of the pearls, just do the tube setting on the end. You mean like this instead? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think those will get lost. Maybe not. I could go with a bigger stone, but I don't. A bigger stone. Um, I you feel like. The trains. Say again. You could try citrine beads if you don't want to put pearls because then you can tie it all up. Yeah, my my uh, my gut is telling me that this is already pushing, taking away yeah. from this. Yeah. It's just too vivid. It's a beautiful stone. It's in the perfect, perfect cut. So yeah. I may have something else using it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, my gut is telling me to go with the sapphires at this point. Hmm. Um, yeah. What if you don't do the sapphires and just keep it the way it is? You still have you, to work with the middle part and you can add the pearls as another accent, not put the yellow, not do the sapphires. What are you going to do in the middle? So that you're talking be a, a way kind of thing with a pearl in the center? Something, yeah, yeah. Is there, is, is there something that you're not liking about the sapphires? I'm loving the sapphires. Oh, that's... I, I mean, I, I can love... Too. I love the I just don't like the large of one. it. I love the glitziness of it, but I sometimes I think that it's taking away from the beautiful stone. Personally. And the pearls are overbearing. Yeah, I think the pearls are too much. Yeah. Yes. So you'd rather have a clean necklace? I yes. think it's more elegant looking. Yes. Yeah. I actually so, like those little bits of wires poking out just by themselves. They're looking really nice. Well, so part of what brought me to, to the Pearls Gang, and you guys, so this is this is an interesting exercise for me because um, I'm having to I having I'm having to explain my rationale to you guys in ways that my brain doesn't always explain to me. But part of what brought me to the Pearls is I did have to start thinking about how am I going to connect these? What am I? What is going to make it still be fluid enough? to rest around the neck in such a way that it doesn't poke out all over the all over the place. So How the about metal balls. Pardon? How about little metal balls? So a bead in between each? Yeah. So not a bead, not a bead, but a granule. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm actually talking about the literal mechanism between each one because remember these have to have some mobility between them. In order to rest, in order to rest, this isn't going to be a stiff collar. It needs to rest on the neckline, and maybe it's time to put it on the neck piece so that you can see a little bit more. I'm just trying to think which neck piece is maybe easier. Do a tiny, do a tiny hinge. Yeah, and tiny hinge on these kinds of wires. Uh, that's not. There's not a mater enough material on the ends to really put a functional hinge on, at least not one that I'm capable of building, because this is what, like 18 gauge wire or something, 13 gauge wire. Um, so what I'm probably gonna do, um, and this is what comes of not designing, yeah, this is 13 gauge wire. Um, this, com this is what comes of not designing it more concretely from the outset. And you guys will find these kinds of technical challenges in, uh, in your pile of things that you got stuck on, that's part of why we got stuck. We may not know at the, at the time we jammed up, but it's letting us go, hey, 
something is keeping me from fin finishing this. And for me, it was definitely about how am I going to make this fluid and connected? So the mechanism that I'm most likely to use on this is itty bitty little jump rings facing this way on on each end of the of the pokes of the sticks, and then a single tiny jump ring in between, and that gives the movement that I need for it to bend around the shoulder and come over, you know, the over over a shoulder mm -hmm. where it needs to hit and fold. Because mm -hmm. um, now my form and function are battling each other if I do anything that's much stiffer than that. However, it does not solve for how do I get what I want out of the center meat points, right? And so, so far, the only idea I've come up with that gives me still that, still having a little bit of flex and then keeps these together at a point is that I need to run something through them. So essentially like the paddle hammering that we were talking about earlier, um, the, I may have to forge enough that I can drill through and run a wire between them, maybe beating it up on either side. And that, then I went, well, you know, if I'm going to make a little wire cutting through why wouldn't I hook something on it and so that's what got me there and made me realize that I was suddenly looking at what felt very art deco in shape where the pearls would be sensible be, be a sensibly in keeping decorative addition not the big one that's what I started with the big ones but it would need to definitely be one of the smaller ones so some of this is about what am I going to do to connect it I still love the shapes um, and I could, I could solder these together in, as sets and only connect at the intersections of the, the smallest points, right? So I, that's an option is that each of these becomes a unit that I solder together. That's where it starts to hit our form function again, because let's think about how this, I'm going to actually do it on my metal form because that's a little easier. It won't fall off as much. How does it wrap over the neckline? So we're talking about stones off of there briefly. We're talking about something that is here-ish, right? Offset a little bit because we've said it's going to balance out. There's going to be some wire in between. But as soon as I hit my first large piece, it doesn't have, it's going to stick out like this if I make them a single unit. If you make it a single unit, you can still bend it over that curve. The challenge with bending it over the, over the neck then is that um, if different people have different sized necks and so that it's going to bend back and forth. However, that's one true. of the things that this made me think about is with this much weight, I tend to make these necklaces fairly collarbone level, right? But in this case, I may need to design this necklace so it hangs a lot further down and gives more of a V down at the bottom and gives me some opportunity. And this is why I brought out the black form because I think I can get it set up better on the black form where I want it. So let's see if I can get it down there. And then our first piece, yeah, see, nothing that I could have come up with with this scale doesn't bend somewhere across the neck, which is why I wanted a connection that can make it do this at the pivot point. All right, so I've kind of designed myself into a corner if I keep this scale, and I'm really enamored, <clears throat> excuse me, enamored of the scale relative to the largeness of the stone and the piece we're working with. But I may get away with just moving it even further down. And then our first. I think your screen froze unless it's me. Oh, did it? Anybody else? I'm okay. I'm okay. It's been doing okay. that with me. You yeah, it has been. Keep on. Leave and then come back yeah. in. So I have a know, feeling if you give it a slight you... bend, not much, but just a bit of a bend, it will work. <laughs> I could. I think I I think I want it to be a little more fluid than locking them together will be, but I'm going to have to probably make 
a couple of spares of each size and mm -hmm. see what what the connections work as. Mm -hmm. um, so I very much I'm I, I like movement in my work. So yeah. the ability to do this is more interesting to me than having it locked. Maybe it's easier for me to show you on me. So we're talking about. At Would the you very, think about the half moon jump rings? Half like, moon? you know, it's not, it's like, a you know, the half of a jump ring. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I would probably for these, because it's such a tiny connector point, I uh -huh. would probably use just really small hole jump rings and I'll cut away uh, a little channel for them to set in, um, which gives me a lot more surface area. Um, but I'll have to play around with that. It could be, it could be two half moons and then one hole jump ring in between. Um, but that still doesn't solve the bottom end connection. I need something that's still, if I leave movement at the top, I still need movement at the bottom while keeping them connected in some way. Um, so it needs enough flex. So, but this is not art. This is a challenge for another day. I just want you guys to understand um, some of the thinking and why I even brought out the pearls was because I started going down the path of how am I going to connect it. And I have not even begun to consider, well, that's not true. I have begun to consider, I have not found anything that sparks joy, as Marie Kondo would say, in terms of how am I going to clasp this? Because um, I think I really need to understand what my main unit of the two pieces is going to be. Um, so one of the things I do when I'm stuck on that is I'll pull out a series of books that have interesting architecture in them. This was one of the ones that I pulled today. I cannot for the life of me find my Tabakovka clasps book, which is one of my favorites when I'm looking for clasp ideas. Um, um, course, we see it backwards though. Oh, on that, do, hang on, let's see if the other camera gives it forwards. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it looks backwards to me. Um, so the Penland book of jewelry is a wonderful one to have um, in your collection if you don't already. Um, and it has, among other things, it has a John Cogswell exercise, but they have a bunch of work and then work from the students of those instructors. And there's a specific lesson from each of them. So this one includes um, some stuff on patination and uh, some stuff on forging from John. Um, so techniques include non-traditional color on metal from Marilyn De Silva, John Cogswell's Forging, Jamie Pellissier, Pellissier, gold alloying, um, fabricating with steel, technique casting, die forming, alternative, alternative stone setting, electroforming, etching, and granulation. Um, and I think they only did one in the series, but it's a beautiful book. It is a Lark book. Unfortunately, I think Lark closed its doors for these. Um, and the one that was really interesting to me that I need to now go and see if I can find other pictures of is this Carol Webb necklace that I think her clasp must be under this part of the book. Let me see if I can zoom in on that one for a little bit for you. So it's a really intriguing piece that clearly has some height and dimension to it. And I see the hint of what may be a clasp that I want to go digging and see if I can find out what, what she did in the back there. Um, so that was one that I pulled aside. Another thing that I do is I look at mechanisms books. This is another one that is something you won't have a whole ton of use for um, unless you start doing like Nash Quinn classes all the time, because I'm sure Nash loves this book. I wouldn't be surprised at all if he has variations on his shelf, because there's like five different groups of people that have done this kind of book. Doesn't give you how to make a clasp, but it might give you connections and mechanism ideas and it's all from things like steam engines and you know railway cars and ship rigging and how do you knot things like you know what do we do and we can recreate those knots in metal um so these are the kinds of things i'm going to flip through to get some inspiration on clasps can you show uh, the you know when you are sorry can you show the cover of that i didn't quite get that written down 1800 Mechanical Movements, Devices, and Appliances by Gardner D. Hiscox. And I know that there's a couple others there of different numbers of mechanical movements. Um, Thank you. That, and there's even one of the books, because I have several of these, 
Um, one of the books has an online uh, animated version of it that you can see the mechanisms in action for a lot of the mechanisms. Yeah, Na Nash talked about that. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Very cool. Somebody else had a question? Um, I was just saying that instead of putting the clasp at the back with the necklace that you showed, you could just make uh, the clasp in the front with the stone. That's where I'm headed. Yeah. Um, it's either going to be clasping to the point of the, of the big stone, or it might be a mechanism built into the, the wires connecting the two. Yeah. The stone and the, and the hollow form. Yeah. Um, but again, I have to sort of process that because that's going to impact my order of operations. You'll hear me talk a lot about order of operations. Hollow forms in particular, you need to know what you're going to be doing with them before you close them up, right? And so if I want any kind of a box clasp under there or a sliding, slotting clasp, I need to know it before I frame the, the reticulation piece. Um, that would also impact if I could set a stone down into it or not. So where are we now? Where I am now is that I need to get my stone put on its back plate, which is where we left off in the last session. Um, and so I've done between last time and this time, I did a little bit of cleaning up of my metal, flattening it. I cheated a little bit by putting the back plate in my hydraulic press to get out some of the waviness that I put into it when I was trying to heat it the other day. And I did a little bit better job of um, sanding the bottom of my bezel frame. Um, I'm going to, because it's been a while, I'm going to just make sure that it is still fitting snugly. It's got a little bit of a warp on one side, so I'm going to clean that up a smidge because I don't want to go into the soldering thing without having it in place. And then I'm going to solder this down. So we'll hop over to the bench. Rachel? Yeah? I, I just had a thought that... I like the idea of bringing the bottom piece together. And I was, you had talked about maybe doing something like the paddle or feeding through with a wire. And then I was thinking, you know, you could do round wire. And of course, the idea of something dangling there. But what if you brought those together with a triangular shaped jump ring, which would echo all the other triangles? Hmm. So we're talking, so we've got our curve and then running a jump ring through it that comes down to a point, you mean? Exactly. Echo? Exactly. Because that, yeah. yeah. I, I, because when you said the idea of like drilling through and, and balling up, I just didn't like visually how that contrasted. So it just, my I just went to triangle jump ring so i'm just mentioning it because i think it really echoes what you're doing there and it's simple so i would still have to drill through to get that yeah. and yeah. I have to decide the shape of it i probably need to try and force the curve to follow this that's an interesting i'm gonna put a note down to try and i'm gonna have to do a lot of modeling of a few different connections for this one uh triangle jump ring now you can do a series. <laughs> so the problem oh, is that this stone is one of the most spectacular that I've had from, um, this is a um, Joe Jelks at Horizon Lapidary, and I haven't seen him cut a lot of this clarity. Uh, I mean, he's all of his stones are fabulous quality, but of the clear, of the translucence, he, he tends to work more in the um, uh, opaque, um, oops, I went to the wrong screen for you guys, uh, more of the opaque, um, where are you doing those? Okay, so I just wanted I, to know with the uh, wires that you have, do, yeah. do the wires have to connect to each other um, at the points that they meet, or would you put a jump? Consider putting a hinge on top and then connecting them all together. So the hinge, there's not. Oh, uh, you guys are talking about cutting the top off. Yeah, let me, when I get back to the bench, let's talk about that. Um, I really like the poking out bits of wire that create that extra negative space. And in order to get enough surface area to do a decent hinge, I would have to trim those back so that it's close fitting and it doesn't, it doesn't leave the same form for me. Um, no, I meant the hinge on top of the wires. Thank you. Like, 
Oh, like a cross connecting. So it's not actually a hinge. It's just a wire run through two tubing pieces. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think that'll break the line a little bit, but I'll have to lay I'll have to lay some of that idea out and see. Uh, let's see, my medium solder. So I ordered myself one of um, Lion Punch Forge's great uh, setup rigs that I'm forget tie tie something that is good for laying out pieces um, because last time I was fighting the heat on this bigger piece. Um, I'm gonna, I, that did not come yet. I'm waiting on it because I asked him to do a modification to one of his picks for me. Um, so ideally I would have something like that to be able to get underneath it. Instead, I'm using my enameling trivet. And when I'm working this big, again, the goal is you got to get the back plate heated up more than the sidewall. And so I just did a Prips Flux first. And then I'm going to put down um, a layer of uh, of the white crispy flux, the name of which Griff Flux is what I use for this, because I want to mark out where I want to put my solder down. And as I mentioned on the last video session, um, I tend to uh, encourage putting solder inside in most cases, but because I know I'm going to be trimming close, and because this is a translucent stone, in this case, I'm going to be putting my solder on the outside and drawing it towards the center. Um, so my tweezers, I cleaned up so much yesterday that I can't find anything. Hate it when that happens. Uh, and again, uh, a mention, oops, that's the inside. I see how much I do it. I go out of habit to put it on the inside. Um, I put my solder a fingernails width away from the seam because then I have just that instant of being able to watch it flow before it wants to jump up the wall. So by putting it ever so slightly away from the, from the solder flow point that I'm going for, it gives me extra time to keep it clean. So I'm going to put a fair amount on here because it's a pretty big piece. And I would ideally like it to get flowing and stay flowing. And so you'll find that I rarely um, put my pieces up on trivets or even wire bundles, except when I'm working large like this because I like working on a fire brick and a fire brick has a really good refractive or reflective, I don't know what it is, but it has a good bounce of the heat. So it doesn't need as much to be heated underneath. I am focusing my heat on the back plate as much as possible and trying to keep the whole piece getting up to temperature consistently. The piece over here though. So I'm avoiding being right on top of the walls. I'm using a fairly heavy torch tip or hot torch tip because it's such a big piece. Does and that mean I, two, a two or a three? Couldn't hear you. Say again. Does that mean it's a tip number two or number three? In the tip one. Oh. <laughs> In a sec, we're getting flow, so I've got to concentrate a little bit. There we go, and I'm going to pull it back down because I need the pressure. Um, it's still a one, it's just up fairly high. And I'm going to actually add some stick soldering to this because I need to get it to flow where I really want it when it's not flowing all the way.
And I really want to make sure my front corners get fully soldered down. That's an easy place to miss. So I'm flooding it a little bit more than I like to, but again, I'm doing that from the outside so that it's not getting super messy. And sometimes if it's really giving you trouble in one spot, besides pushing down on it, you can sometimes get it, get a pick to encourage it to the corners where it's not quite, there we go. It's not quite flowing the way you want. You can't count on the pick doing it all because it may just be a surface pull of the liquid metal. There we go, okay. All right, much smoother than last time. So we now have well soldered back plate. Remember, we went with a fairly heavy gauge because I'm thinking I'm going to do some cutaway on this. And uh, I think this was a 20 gauge um, wall, maybe even an 18. I can't remember. I can check it in a minute. The back plate is probably a 22. Um, and then it's patterned, so it got a little skinnier than that. So I'm going to quench that and put that in the pickle. Any questions about that process? Okay. I could watch you solder all day long. <laughs> so, you know, soldering is the thing that when um, when I was asked to teach for the first time, um, when I was out at Brookfield Craft Center, um, it was the thing I was most fearful. It was the thing that was stopping me. It was paralyzing me from being able to teach. Because one, I was only midway proficient myself. There was lots of things that I was messing up when I was soldering. And two... I knew it when I saw it, but I didn't know if I could articulate it. So what I did in working on that and trying to prep to see whether I felt comfortable enough to do it is I made out of all my scrap, I made a boatload of cutout shapes and just did, um, I think, probably 50 or 100 post earrings um, and just practiced post setting. So over and over again, that and chain making are the two best things you could do to get your, your brain connected to soldering. Um, and then it's little tips like, you know, when people are solder soldering for the first few times, they're really, really looking all over the place at everything. And then they want to look at the torch and then they want to look at the solder and, and you don't have time to look at all those things. So what I'm looking at when I'm soldering is where I want the solder to flow. Um, and the torch has to become just an extension of your hand. And you need to train your eye and brain to communicate about that flash point that we hit on solder. The flash point is the hardest piece for new soldering, new people to soldering to get into their brains because it happens so fast and then it goes to melt, right? So they get all nervous about it and they cut away too soon after they've melted something. So um, I needed to get to a point where I could articulate the acts of soldering, the, the steps of soldering in ways that weren't necessarily using metal words, if that makes any sense. So the thing that I describe most about when you're putting one of those kinds of heavy bezels down or any large scale bezel down, um, the thing, the, the phrasing that I came up with for that is that you need to see a flash that looks like when you're sitting out on the beach at sunrise and the sun is about to come up and it hits that magical time where it hasn't actually crested to see the sun, but there's this flash of light that happens along the horizon line. That's what I look for when I'm looking for that flow of solder. As soon as I see that whoosh, happen, that's when I start, you'll see I start moving the turntable. And if you're not soldering with a turntable, man, they will change, they'll rock your world. Go get yourself a cheap turntable and set it up because you need to be able to keep the movement happening while you're working, especially with silver work. Um, so yeah, I enjoy soldering now. I used to hate it with a passion deep in my soul. But once you can connect that hindbrain response to the flash, so that you your your brain and hands react before your mind could articulate why you have moved on to the next step. That's when you'll start to get the routine down. Um, and then the next magical step is understanding pick soldering, um, because pick soldering is one of those things that it'll speed up your process, and again, you'll become a machine with it. Um, and we can do some examples of those, and you're going to see a lot of pick soldering when we start connecting these pieces. That's my ramble on soldering. So any questions before we continue on to whatever's next? 
Can I ask a personal question? Sure. Um, is your tattoo in Sanskrit? My tattoo is in Sanskrit, and you're only the third person ever to, to recognize it as Sanskrit and not ask if it was some kind of Iranian script or one of the variants that has come from Sanskrit. Yeah, it, in its simplest form, it's it says breathe. It's for mudra position. It's to remind me when I'm driving not to get angry. It doesn't work very well. <laughs> good. <laughs> That's a good good message to have. <laughs> In, in the longer version of it is uh, breathe life anew or something along those lines. There's yeah. a couple variants on it. It's never, you know, it's never quite as specific as that. It was the first tattoo I wanted and the last tattoo I got. Um, any um, other questions? Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I was thinking of getting a hydraulic press, but I have one table on which I, I already have a rolling mill. I have a bench vise and I have a drilling machine. So can I put a hydraulic press on it? Uh, it depends on the the strength of the table you've got it on. I have what a strong you, table. Yeah, I mean, yes, it's and then then the next question is, are you getting in the way of other tools? Because remember that a hydraulic press has a good handle on it, and if you're getting a power one, it takes up a lot of space. If you're doing it by hand, not as much. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, for me, if I were going to take one tool off to make room, I would get a freestanding stand for the rolling mill. Um, All right and move that one over, but make sure it's a sturdy one with enough weight to keep the mill from tipping and you bolt it down to your floor or something. Yeah, uh, all right, yeah. thank you. Sure. My, my husband, who's extremely handy, put my mill on a stand that he got off of eBay. Yeah. It's a metal stand that was for like a saw, for like in a carpentry shop. And nice. then it had locking wheels on it so I can move it around, so. Yeah. That's another, you know, that makes it very handy and does give you more tabletop. Nice. Nice. Um, any other questions about where we are on the project, just to get us back on to that? Rachel, can I ask you real quick about your weave cuff? Sure. That you're wearing? So is that um, the piece of woven material? Do you have that between like two square rails? No, I have it in slotted wire. Slotted that. wire, okay. Which doesn't come in a whole lot of sizes, um, but so it's framed and then every piece of the weave is soldered down along the edges. Okay. And trimmed and cleaned it up so that I can slot it onto the wire. And it is a royal pain in the butt to get all your corners cornered. Well, my uh, doing as that slot makes a lot of sense. Because yep. then you have it set in, and once you get your solder flowing, it really locks it in instead of, you know, if you think of a piece of screen with all those individual strands, if you're trying to butt it up to a mm -hmm. piece of wire, that that's much harder to get your solder flowing. So I have never heard of slotted wire. Did you slot it yourself with like a no. separate disc? No, you can, you can buy slotted wire at Rio. Um, I've okay. seen it at other places. It's a little different than channel wire. Um, okay. Slotted wire is really, uh, um, it's round wire that has a groove drilled down into it. Okay. Okay. I, okay. I thought it was round, so but it was hard to tell. Okay. Thank you. That said, that said I did this before having ever taken a class um, from Jeannie Pratt. And Jeannie teaches a different approach for framing. Um, which is worth taking her class just to learn about um, where she's putting it on a backing plate and doing things around the backing plate to frame. Okay. So if you if you get a chance, she's a delightful teacher and absolutely a blast. Um, <laughs> this, I've stuck with this for the bracelets in particular because people really like to see, they don't always believe that it's hand woven. So right. being able to back of the bracelet is really useful but for example my earrings I can't and I'm still fighting to come up with a ring design for the series um, and the ring design absolutely will not be able to have the rough texture on the back of it so yeah cool. okay uh so let me pull the piece out of the pickle and see where we stand hopefully it did not distort in the course of that heating that's another important factor in the soldering, which is um, make sure that you are keeping heat on it as little as possible because the bigger pieces are going to be even uglier when they warp. Um, 
because they they warp in ways that really shift things out of position. They're a lot harder to reposition. So let's see if our stone still fits. Ooh, it's gonna be snug. Ah. Change your camera so I can see. Oh, right, I'm on the wrong one, sorry. <laughs> Okay, we might have a repair needed because I've got one little bit of the front lip came in a little bit as I was doing that. So I need to push this little piece. Oops, that was a shot. I need to get this to come out there because this stone is not one that I can cut down without destroying it. It should fit if I can just get that little corner that tucked itself in. So you see how this warped in a little bit? It's tipping in. As I soldered it down, I probably overheated that little stretch and I'm gonna now need to do a, a repair job. So back to the bench we go. Now we see if my unsoldering is as successful as my soldering was. I put my goggles. So Rachel, why wouldn't you just take flat nose pliers and bend it out? Because it's not actually, it's not that it's bent in at the top, it's that it is soldered too far this way. At Can't the, see. Right? So yeah. I'll never get the stone to lie flush against it. So it's so, too far in. Too far in. It's not like you can move it yeah, forward. Again, I can actually see it visibly. It looks like it scooted more than the 45 or more than the 90 degree angle that I wanted. So in this case, I'm actually going to not heat the whole piece much. I might do a little to warm it up just so it's not stealing the heat from the rest. But I'm not going to focus my heat almost anywhere except the area that I'm trying to get to flow again so that I can hold my tweezers in, but not near, not at it yet, because I don't want them superheating. I want them at the ready as soon as my solder flashes. And it may take a moment, because this is a big piece. There we go. Come on. And I'm just doing a gentle attempt to get it to push its way. Oh, too far. A little further out. And because that was the corner we angled, it wants to break off. So now I'm gonna eyeball it and hope that I got it right. And I'm also gonna toss a little more piece, little tiny piece of, in this case, medium solder in that corner that I just broke off to refill. Because remember, one session ago, two sessions ago, we did the corner sawing and filing. And so that's the weak spot. So as I've said in other workshops, learning to fix your own mistakes is going to give you some of the best lessons and best skill improvement you can possibly have. Not go quite where I wanted it, a little bit more. Got to put flux on it, which is part of why this is giving me such grief. Corner is now stabilized a little bit. Put more solder in the corner still. So I'm overheating the, the outside corner because I didn't do a lot in the inside corner and I need to get my solder to flow a little better. Push it too far out. There. 
this is wanting to fall off. So I don't know if I can safely make a full repair without cleaning it up a little bit. Give it one more shot and then I may pull the piece off and rebuild it. So what's, what you guys aren't able to see on screen right now is that right in here, I am not getting full contact down below. I've got it at the corner, I've got it at the end, but there's a gap spot happening that I may have too grubby at this point. I might have to pickle and re-solder one more time. Let's try it one shot, get this extra solder flowing. Yep, I'm getting a gap. All right, so I'm gonna quench this, pickle it, see where my stone is in terms of fit. It's definitely moved back out, but I may have now moved it too far out. And I may decide to pull just this little corner segment off and rebuild, reconstruct it. We will see once we get it cleaned up. And there's a couple tricks I could have used to be a little more certain of my positioning. One of the best is what's called cutting stitches. Um, and I'll try to make sure that we do a demo of that at some project or other, um, in which you take a graver and you cut from whichever side you know you're not going to care about. Um, you cut little stitches like you would if you were doing bead setting at the line and it becomes little claws that stay just long enough to hold your metal right where you want it. Downside is it can really scrape stuff up and I'm trying to work fairly clean because of this translucent stone. Um, so what I'd really need to get that locked in exactly where I want it is on either side of the points that, uh, that wanna move out. So those opening at the top, those two flaps. Um, you could also grave down a little channel for it. So you could trace out exactly where you want it on your back plate and grave a little like groove that you then set things down into and that positions it exactly where you want. So there's variations on the theme. Um, that latter one is good because it gets an incredibly solid solder seal once you get it to flow because let me draw this one because this is an important factor in soldering, especially if you've ever had a piece come apart on you. So when we are soldering things together, let's say we're soldering our back plate down. So what happens as the solder flows is we get a little bit of this action. What we hope we also get is a little bit of this action, right? We need it to flow between them, which is why a lot of times when you're soldering, you're told, get it to flow from one side and then draw the solder to the other side, because that's what's getting this. If we only have the flow up the side, it's gripping it, but it's not really connecting the material to each other. Um, and so if you make a channel, what you do is you make more surface area. So I'm going to draw this large. If we do one version that is this, and we do one version that is set down into a channel, the surface area that is being held by the solder is either just this little bit, and there's only one, one direction that it can get pulled, or it covers more surface area and is held more tightly, and is less likely to be able to pull be pulled by bending because it's notched into something. So this is why if you want really, really strong earring posts, 
you're going to drill, a, take a little ball burr and drill the hole exactly where you want your post sitting and then set your post down into it because then you get your solder coming up all around and really holding it in place. Do I solder, do I uh, burr hole all of my back earring backs? Oh, heck no. I don't have the patience. But if you want something super, super durable, it's the way to go. So especially if it's a heavier pair of earrings or what have you, that's very important. Could you use a center punch? Um, I would not in general because you're punching from the back and you'll make a divot that may show on the front of your work by then. Um, so a ball burr, you just have a, that much more control over. That's a good thought. You're right. Yeah, yeah anything that has that downward for So it, for me, it's always forgetting to put my maker's mark on things. <laughs> um, and so I finally was like, why am I, why am I fighting myself? Why don't I just make a pile of them that I've stamped on little discs and I'll solder them on when I forget. Um, but yeah, I would, it's the same thing. I would often go, oh crap, I got to punch it. And then I punch it and I go, oh, I damaged the design on the front. Um, so yeah. And um, actually your illustration showed a curved either wire or piece of metal. Do you have to curve it? You don't curve it when you put in ear posts. So it depends on the kind of post you're using. So I actually use, um, there's a, a post that is all one piece from Rio. So it's not got the little ring cap. I hate the little ring cap ones. I like the one that has a tiny little T topper to it. And so that already has some natural fits into the little divot. Um, if I were doing heavier gauge connections because it doesn't just apply to ear wires obviously if you want if you want a truly strong like prong attached to something you can drill through your piece put your prongs into the holes and it's going to be solid 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 just like that's why on a lot of wedding ring builds you'll see that they put a center post they drill through the the ring and post it in and that again gets really solidly attached um, it's also often done with easy solder so that if you need to replace the center stone, you can blow it and pull the whole post out on the prong setting. Um, so in that case, it's a drill through on an earring post. It's such a tiny little wire that's going in there that do you have to curve it? No, but I wouldn't leave, if you're making your own ear wires, I wouldn't leave it rough. I might just toss a, a cup burr on the end of it to soften it because you're gonna do a cup burr on the other end for the ear anyhow. So plop, plop, you got it on both, plunk it in, and then you've got the curvature. But no, that tiny little difference between having a curve and having a flat post, you're just going to get solder fill in there holding it in place. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, so this is still pickling. Any other questions or has this inspired anybody to ask about any of the projects that you've got in your own box? Does anybody have questions while we're waiting? Uh, do you have a draw plate? Like a draw wire drawing machine, like the proper draw. I, um, I have the ability to draw wire by using the my my draw plates and tongs in a bunch of equipment that I have to set up separately. But I don't have a crank one. I have I have the uh, so John Cogswell gave me his drawings for how he makes one out of basic supplies, and I've always meant to make one, but I haven't had any distance, nor do I like drawing my own wire if I can avoid it, so I haven't bothered building it, because that would require that I actually draw wire more often than I do to make it worthwhile. Tubing, tubing, I enjoy being able to draw down. Yeah, that's uh, what I'm actually, uh, because I, I want to do tube setting with uh, one centimeter, one uh, millimeter diamonds. And I want to use a thicker gauge wire uh, pipe that I can just, um, you know, use a uh, drill bit to empty out the center a little bit of metal and then just set the stone in it. So I'm kind of wondering how to do that because I don't have a, a drawing draw bench with me. So do you have a really, really solid vice on a really si solid table? Uh, yes. Like one that if you were to put something in it and tug with your full body weight, wouldn't dump you I, on your... <laughs> I don't think the table will dump on me, but I don't know if I have the strength to pull it with my hands. So it's it's all about how you set it up when you're doing tubing. Oops, you got an idea, Wendy? 
Well, what I have is the Harbor Freight table that you have in the background there because it has such a great vice. I put my draw plates in that. And at the other end, I have a, a block of wood that I have set a boat crank on. And yep. then I use C clamps to clamp on that where you have that red vise. Um, I C clamp it on and then, you know, I have my draw tongs and that little space with that great little bench is perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you, if you, if you don't have the space to put the full one in, you can do it at your bench, but you work with, you want to work with a piece of tubing that's sort of this long and it's going to waste the last inch of your tubing or you'll have to scrap metal it. What you do is you solder in with hard solder uh, a thick wire that is the diameter of the tubing so that you give yourself an extra tail to hold yeah. on to, right? Yeah. And so that's what you're actually pulling on through your draw plate. Yeah, I have tried that. I just don't think I have the strength to pull it with yeah. my bare hands. Actually, so, that, that's actually what I'm strong, struggling with because the crank one I have, um, um, the institute that um, I used to go to, they've allowed me to use their machine, but it's an hour one way and then another hour. So, you know, um, and that's kind of what I'm struggling with. Yeah, I can tell you that tubing for settings is one of those things that I buy an array of tubing and keep it on hand. Um, I, I will always choose heavy wall tubing over the regular weight tubing yeah. if you find it. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, if it, so the, the times that I usually end up having to draw down my own tubing is when I'm trying to make a very specific hinge in hinge setting where I need yeah. two tubes are compressed. Used to be that you could get uh, nested tubing all over the place, but people just aren't manufacturing the same sizes that they used to, unfortunately. Yeah. So it sounds like you need to get a crank system like Wendy was describing. Yeah. Can you, uh, Wendy, can you post a photo of what you have? Um, I don't have the ability to, the know-how to post a photo, but I can walk down to my garage and flip my camera. <laughs> oh, thank you. That, and, that's really sweet of you. <laughs> and show you that while we are pickling but don't look at the rest of the stuff on the bench like my <laughs> ring sizer and my rolling mill and I've got a lot of stuff on that bench <laughs> <laughs> um, does anybody have other things that they wanted to show this evening or any open questions to keep you moving between now and next session while I get this from the pickle Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? <laughs> All right. Okay. Here's a flip. So, oh, I see. You just attach the tubing to your car and back your car out so that you have enough strength to draw well, it, huh? That's an idea. So, here is the boat <laughs> winch. <laughs> and, Okay, and then at the other end, where the golf clubs are, is the, you know, the little vice. Nice. So yeah. So it's a nice winch. The en enclosed winch is far more. And it was, what, $45 or something like that on Amazon? Oh. And you just hook the, the little thing up to it. Fabulous. Okay. That's interesting. Mm hmm Okay, gang. So the good news is that it fits better than it did, <laughs> but it's still not where I need it to be. Oh, Oops, I'm on the wrong screen. Hang on. So, um, oh, I need to spotlight, don't I? No, we can see you. There we go. So uh, it fits better at the top. But now my problem is during all of that superheating that I had to do, I got it too tight along the side. Oh, please tell me it's not stuck. Mm -mm. Um, so it this upper corner doesn't fit quite the way it needs to. It's I made it a little too snug for it to hit right here. So now my problem 
is this little stretch right here. Now this one may actually be the warping. So let's see if I can first attempt to just straighten the wall. I don't think so. Nope. So I'm gonna have to go back in there. Oh, I'm out of the frame. I'm gonna have to go back in and I'm gonna have to, I think I'm gonna have to sacrifice this front corner and have it pop off and then straighten out this long wall to get it where I need it to go. Because otherwise, damn, it's a beautiful fit into this side and up to this point. So one more, once more into the breach. Can you just stretch it? No, because it's it's the problem isn't the the walls are nice and solid. It's that it's in too too close here. See how it took a little tiny bit of a curve bend there? Uh -huh. That little tiny bit of change bit of change when it should have been straight out. See that little nick in the corner? Mm -hmm. It's going in a little bit and it needs to have come along the straight line. But by overheating and pulling at this front piece, I tucked it in a little more than I meant to. Um, so I'm going to try one more time. Third mm -hmm. time. <laughs> but this time I'm going to actively take off the little extension and then I'll rebuild it once I've got it positioned well. So once again, a little bit of heating of the back plate, but not a lot anywhere except for where I'm trying to get it to flow again. That little bit of surgery A little bit of straightening. I don't know if it's enough straightening, but here's open. Quench it. I'm not going to uh, bother with uh, pickling again until I've figured out whether that I've done enough to get that stone to fit. So back over to the bench. And this is not uncommon for me when I'm working a large stone with an open setting that I have to do a little bit of this back and forth. Now I need to straighten things again. Okay, so this is going to be enough once I've done a little bit of cleanup of the inside. This will be a decent setting. I think I'm going to oh, rather... good. Yeah. Uh, right, right do you need to solder that bit, bit back? Would you need to... So do you want to solder that bit back? I do want to solder that bit back, but I realize that I'm going to try it after I have cut away because that'll give me a little more luxury, because part of the challenge in getting it perfect is how much back plate there is that's stealing my heat. 
So as soon as I cut away enough of this material, that'll make it a little more flexible for sizing. I was but wondering I, if you'd like to do a series of prongs there instead to make it a little decorative. Could, yeah, we talked about that, about possibly putting like a single gold tipped prong coming down. Um, so, no, I was thinking like a few, like, um, you know, like you have a rail, it kind of gives that effect. Yeah, the other thing that I might do is a tube set stone post up at that the front nice. yeah. so that I repeat the, the sapphire motif. I'm going to want to look at it cleaned up before I do that. Yeah. Um, but right now what I would like is to put in my um, my cutaway so that I can get a better feel for it and see how much that loosens up my setting. Because this is just this side of too tight still. Because it wants to stay. That's good that it wants to stay, but not yet. So now I'm going to take my little pattern that I did. Oh, I cut my pattern, so I don't know if it's going to match as well. Eh, that's still pretty good. I'm going to take my little pattern and trace it in to give myself my cutaway. Except all my pens are on their deathbed today. And I'm also going to trim away the excess around the outsides. But I'm going to leave myself a little bit of scrap in case I need to do some additional soldering from out there. Okay, so, oops, so I wiped off my own pattern. Let's try that again. So I'm going to put in a fairly chunky blade. I'll probably use, um, eh, let's see. I think I'll probably go with a one or a one aught. And I don't have any one offs. I do have ones. And I'm gonna cut away my piercing, make a commitment to that piercing. And then I suspect this will be where we want to stop tonight, just looking at the time. Goggles so I can actually see what I'm doing. I really need bionic eyes. <laughs> Okay. So now we've got a little bit of the sense of the shape that we're going to end up with. I think I may need to take a smidge more off of this side of my cutaway. Um, and that also tells me what I have for where I can post if I'm going to go with a post instead of a wall. Um, I'm sort of digging that idea of doing a tube set post um, with one of the accent stones. Let me see what that would be looking like. More for you guys. Let's 
So we would potentially put a little post. Come back here, Stone. <laughs> Definitely the end of the day. So possibly one of the stones as the end post, in which case I need to leave a little tab and put it there. Or I just recreate the missing side branch. I'm not sure. Um, that might be a cool offset to lead to our connection. I kind of like that idea. I do too. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to pickle this and contemplate it between now and our next session. Um, I know it doesn't feel like we did much today, but we actually made a lot of design progress. And sometimes these fancier pieces, you need to give it time to breathe. Um, would I normally wait a month between working on it? Probably not, because especially once I start to see all the ideas coalesce into something, I really, really want to keep moving on it. So that's that's going to be hard for me during this particular project online, uh, because I just want to finish once I get started. Um, but yeah, so hopefully that gave you a little insight into what my design brain goes through and gave you some things to think about. I'm expecting that you guys will come back to me with some uh, concave reticulation and some wave reticulation with a pearl set in it next time so that I can see how those look. Um, <laughs> yeah. Any other thoughts? Anything anybody wants to ask or share? No. Nope. Okay. Then I'm going to call it a night and I will see you next on. Oh, when will I see you? I will see you on the. Oh my goodness. My calendar is just not keeping up with me. It'll be June 19th. Yeah. The 19th. Yes. And those of you that are in the Seattle area, if any of you are in the Seattle area, I'll be up at Edmonds the weekend before that at the Edmonds arts festival. Um, which is my next show. It's a lovely one, really beautiful artists. Um, and yeah, that's all I got for tonight. Thanks for coming along on the journey. Thanks a lot, Thank Rachel. You. Thank you. It's Thank been so you. much fun. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank Take you. Care. Thank, Thank you. you.